Welcome to Mindshift, I'm Brandon. Today is another Saturday short. I'm gonna be reacting to a clip by David Guzik today. He has 133,000 subscribers, very popular channel, and here he's gonna be telling us how we should be reading the Bible, and I've got some thoughts on it. But before we dive into that, I wanna do a couple things. First, I wanna hype tomorrow's video. I wanna ask that all of you watch it, that all of you watch as much of it as you can, that you share it, whatever you can do, comment, even if it's just to give a thumbs up or anything. I want this to be a video that really stands out on the channel, as I think it'll be one of the the most helpful videos. Sometimes I do videos to entertain and to inform and generally speaking everything I'm doing has an end goal of helping people but videos like the one I'm going to be doing tomorrow really have the potential to do. I'll be covering the seven things that kept me in the faith longer than I should have and these traps that the average person can get stuck in so very easily and also how to get out of them. So please stay tuned for that. That'll be tomorrow at 9 a.m. Central. The other thing that I want to note is many of you have said hey I don't get your notifications anymore and I've turned on notifications. I've done everything right what's going on I have no idea YouTube must be a theist I really just don't know what I can tell you is I've been extremely consistent I started exactly four months ago and I post videos every single Tuesday Thursday Saturday and Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Time I have not missed one yet we have well over 70 videos in just four months I'm probably doing myself a disservice by putting out so much content while the channel is still smaller because I know that not everyone has seen every video so if you want to help out the channel another thing you could do is is go watch some of those videos that you haven't seen yet. I'm developing very quickly a very large catalog. I also have these sorted into playlists that might make it more helpful or useful for you. On that note, I do wanna say, I see myself doing a Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday for the extended future. I might start dropping Saturdays or the odd Saturday. So. Despite that big brag of consistency, I think I'm gonna start narrowing it down closer to three videos a week on average. The last thing that I wanna do today, and then we'll get right into the content very quickly, is a book giveaway. For any patron that has subscribed to the $25 or higher mark, you have a chance at an entry for a monthly drawing into a free book from me. For every tier above 25, you get additional entries into this, and it definitely worked because our tier came from our top tier, the Iconoclast tier, and that is Sean Skaggs. So the book that that I'm gonna be giving away is God Unanatomy. This is one of my absolute favorite books, period. I'm in love with this book. In fact, it's going to be our next series. So what the author does is she breaks down every individual anatomy part by God, stomach, face, genitals, feet, etc. She has a massive understanding of the context of the time about what this God was like and how he was perceived and how it has changed between the Old and New Testament as well as other accounts of this God and other gods of the time, etc. Like it is a fascinating book. So I think what I want to do is follow her and chapter by chapter kind of do a breakdown for you or a summary for those of you that aren't going to take the time to get through this chunker. Sean, I hope you enjoy this. If nothing else, it'll look pretty on your bookshelf. I'll connect with you on Patreon to get your address if you're comfortable with that and send this out to you. So thank you for your patronage. Thank you to everyone else who has been supporting the channel. We have about 50 of you that are doing so right now. In addition to all of the other ways that you guys do with your liking and watching and sharing and subscribing, Thank you. Let's get into today's video. We're going to start just by watching the clip. Read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and have a journal. A journal where you write, not just entering in on a keypad. And this is what you need to do. Are you listening? Write a one-sentence summary of every chapter of the Bible. I've got two or three of those notebooks in my life. And when I look back, I can't tell you the feeling of just... This is something awesome. You know what it'll do? It'll make you read the Bible and think about what it says. That's a novel idea. Do, do you realize how much of our reading of the Bible is just done in drone mode? Isn't it amazing? It's startling. And when you read your Bible in drone mode, you're not going to get much out of it. But if you read it thoughtfully thinking, okay, I'm just going to write a one sentence summary of this chapter. You will read it paying attention and it'll do something remarkable in your life. Okay, so I wanted to share this for a reason, and I don't have all that much to say about it. That's why it's a Saturday short, but I do want to point out a few things here. There's all kinds of ways that Christians can read their Bible. They can read about it through a Bible study book that isn't even biblical, where it breaks down. I used to do this a lot. My favorite book of the Bible was Job, but I always struggled with it a little bit, and so I read commentary after commentary after commentary on Job. So while it covered the verses, it was still someone else talking 
talking about the Bible. And I'd feel guilty about that, and I'd want to go through the Word, and so sometimes I would do the read the whole Bible in a year thing, and I was just reading to check it off. Drone mode, for sure. And then there'd be other times where I wanted to try to understand the narrative of it, so I'd read it in chronological order. That's something interesting to do. There were times where I took note. Anytime that a verse stuck out to me, I just wrote it down. That verse spoke to me and why kind of cherry picking in that fashion i did similar things to this i don't think i ever did the one sentence per chapter but i would definitely do a summary of each book after i read the book i have all kinds of different journals in my closet right now that cover the different ways that i have read the bible and i have been on both sides of this fence i have definitely been the person that has been as lame as just to open it up at the beginning of the day and say what does god want to show me believing that it was just going to be some mystical experience point my finger to a verse meditate on that verse and what was so funny, and maybe many of you have had this experience, is I would do that and I'd get a verse about how there was women having relations with men who had genitals the size of donkeys. And it's like, well, let's just pick out another one. Oh, this time I ended up more on the right side of the Bible and I got some New Testament verse that is going to be a little easier to apply to my daily life. But the vast amount of times that trying and believing God was going to show me something specific for me and then ignoring the first, second, or third thing that I opened to so I could get to that. Like, oh my gosh, the ridiculousness of creating these religious experiences. It's just so very silly. But yeah, I've read the Bible in about every way that you can read the Bible. I've focused on the Old Testament. I focused on just the Gospels. I focused on the Pauline letters, really trying to understand the salvation message. I focused on the narrative structures of it. I've looked at it as poetry. I've gone back with second and third readings after I became a little more progressive to try to understand more of the meaning and the allegory and the metaphor. I've read it where I took it extremely literal every single word. I've read this Bible with a belief that it is inerrant, and I have also read the Bible with a belief, even as a believer, that this was man-made and fallible. And I've even read the Bible now as an atheist, looking at it for what it's worth in human history. So, long story short, I feel like I have something to say about how we read the Bible. I would like to double down and join David in encouraging you, the believer, to read your Bible and to not read it on drone mode and to indeed read it Genesis to Revelation. Don't skip the boring books. Don't skip the books that don't make sense to you. Don't skip the lineages. Don't skip the hard parts. Don't skip the controversial parts. Read the Bible in its entirety. But do not do this one sentence per chapter wrap up because here's what you're going to do. You're going to read some terrible chapter in Leviticus about the rights of women and how they are worth two thirds that of a man and how when they're menstruating, they need to remove themselves from the group for a week or 10 days so they can remain pure. And you're going to read how women were taken at the end of battles. You're going to read all of this stuff and you're going to get to the end of the chapter. And within that chapter, there's some other things like uh, one of those things is when the husband takes the wife wife after a battle he captures this young virgin woman because they killed all the non-virgins they killed the entire family of this woman they took her they clipped her nails they shaved her head they put her in garments that were unfamiliar to her and then they waited a month before they raped her so that they would know if any offspring came it belonged to them and not that they got their virginal diagnosis incorrect and she was actually pregnant at the time and you're going to read that and there's a verse in there where it says that the men made these women their wives and if you're trying with your Christian lenses on, what you're going to write down is God's mercy in taking care of these women and making them worth something again in the eyes of God and man, right? Like you can easily forget everything you just read, not deal with the hard parts, not deal with what's problematic. Take something out of context, which is that these women became wives. That's true. They weren't just held as slaves with no status. They were made wives. They were still treated horribly. They were there against their will. They were taken from their country and brought into a foreign land and forced by the man that found them desirable to have sex with him and to be his bride. You can put a nice title like wife on it, but it doesn't change the reality. How you interpret that in your little one sentence recap of this one chapter is going to allow you to not have to deal with it. And one of the things I'm talking about tomorrow is our ability for confirmation bias and echo chambers and cognitive dissonance and a whole litany of other things that allow us to take these hard verses that we otherwise wouldn't allow, right? Like if you read this same exact verse in the Quran, you would say evil, horrendous, but then it's Yahweh instead of Allah, and all of a sudden you have a different idea. You see justice, you see mercy. So you write down that God takes care of women, that he cherishes women, 
that he has a plan for women, and that just as we can see him provide a place for them to get married, we can associate that to Jesus being the bride of the church, and we can make some corollary here that doesn't exist or is extremely stretched, and that's what you're going to write down. And that's just one example. If you are going through the Bible with Christian lenses, and your goal is to write one sentence that's going to be useful and meaningful to you when you look back on it, you are going to summarize these books in a completely inappropriate, inaccurate, and unfair way. If you're insistent on taking this kind of advice, I wonder what it would be like if you tried to write a one-sentence summary that was as detailed and descript of what you just read. In this chapter, God sends his army to kill the soldiers, the mothers, and the children, and leave alive the young women that have not known a man yet, for an Israelite soldier to come and pick the ones he thinks are lovely and take them back to be his wife, where she will be held against her will forever and made to have sex and have babies, right? I'm not even trying to go on the other end and say this horrible God forced these men to do these crimes. Just report it. Pretend you're a journalist and the only source you have to go on is this chapter and you want to get as many facts out as possible in one sentence or let's go up to one paragraph, whatever you want to do. I wonder if you did it that way, if you'd have a very different interpretation of the Bible, yet alone going and trying to look for the errors and the contradictions and the problems and only writing down the things that stand out as against God's nature. What if you wrote down all the things you think about God? God is loving. God is just. God is all powerful. God is omniscient. God cares about his creation. God cares about each individual. God has a plan for everyone. God wants none to be lost. God wants all to be saved. God is slow to anger. God is quick to mercy. Write down everything you have assumed about God that has been told to you or that you need to believe in order for this religion to work. And then chapter by chapter, verse by verse, as you go through the Bible, if you see something that does not correlate to that, I want you to write that down in its column. So if you have a column over here that says God is just, and then you read a verse where God has David's wives raped in front of him in public as punishment for David's sin, write down forced rape of wives for husband's sin. And do that throughout the entire Bible being honest, and see how much of God's character adds up. There's a lot of other fun ways we can read the Bible to discover exactly the truth. Bart Ehrman has something that he has his graduate students do where he says, just read the four gospels and write down as many details as you can. Who came to the tomb? How many angels were there? Who was the first one to see Jesus? Did they go and tell anyone? Write every little detail you can, and then compare those four accounts you will be blown away. I did this exercise after hearing about it from airmen a few years ago, and I could not believe how different the Gospels were. But I like mine. I'd really encourage you to try that out. See if the God you believe in, and you love, and you adore, and you've heard about, and that gets preached about on Sunday, and that's inserted into your devotionals, and your study guides, and your Bible studies, see if that God matches up with the actions that God boasts about. We don't have to do any other accountings. We don't have to do anyone's dreams or visions. We don't have to do prophecy. We don't have to do any books that are outside of the canon. Only within the canon, red letter text in the New Testament or any time in the Old Testament where it says God did this or God said this or God commanded this. Just from the source material itself, what this God claims about himself and allows us to know about him, go ahead and write those things down. I dare you. You'll never hear that preached from the pulpit. Couldn't it? Shouldn't it be? Shouldn't we have a God that is good enough, consistent enough in nature, that is holy enough, that wrote a book that is perfect, or at least inspired it, or at least used fallible man to record his words, which you think they would take pretty seriously in their recording of it, and shouldn't he live up to that? Isn't that what you would expect? Like, if you had never read the Bible before, all the excuses and apologetics come into your brain about why it's not like this and why it can't be like this, if you had a perfect God, wouldn't the narrative of that God's beginning in in our awareness and his creation of our universe and our planet and his interactions with first people and his sending of his son down to earth, wouldn't all of that align? I absolutely think it should. Read the Bible, do my exercise, and then see that it doesn't. What would it force you to conclude? One of two things I would guess, that this God either doesn't actually exist or if he does, is not who we claim him to be. And either way, I think that would be enough of a reason to say sayonara, you do not deserve my worship. You do not deserve me to continue to make excuses for you, to tell others about you on your behalf and only in the good light of edited existence. And maybe we'll do this together in a video or make it a series and see what this starts to look like. But I know that when you start looking for it, 
you find it. And it's not my fault because I'm just using the Bible. The same place you're getting your claims of the good and holy and just God. Okay, so Brandon, it says both. That doesn't mean he's not holy. It doesn't mean he's not just. Sure it does. That's exactly what it means, right? If you find the journal of a serial killer and they say, oh, I love my kids. Oh, I want the best for humanity. Oh, I care about each individual. And then 75% of that journal is their plans to torture and kill and enact vengeance and be petty and be jealous. And they record their acts of murder and torture and rape. Would you just cling to the small percentage of their claim to be good? Or would you look at the rest of their words and actions and say, doesn't add up, and judge them accordingly. I think we all know what the reality there is. So why do we make these excuses for God? I really don't know. That's all I wanted to say today. If you're going to take advice like this from preachers on how to read the Bible, please understand that it is already being done to manipulate you into only seeing the good parts that get in the way of truthfully and accurately and responsibly reading this book or collection of books. So challenge extended. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day. Do be here tomorrow at 9 a.m. Central Time for the next video. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tier Iconoclast patrons, Sean Skaggs and Jason Rollins, and my atheist advocate patron, Jared Nichols, for their incredible generosity. Also a big shout out to my secular scholar patrons, of which we have some new ones. All other patrons are listed in the description of each video. Please consider joining this great group if you enjoy these videos or believe in my mission. Thanks and have a great day.